I'm Dr. Adilma Yearwood, and I'm the chair of the Department of Professional Nursing Practice at Georgetown University School of Nursing and Health Studies. I'm here with my colleagues, Dr. Mary Harris, who is the chair of the Department of Advanced Nursing Practice, and Dr. Ladan Eshgavari, who is the director of the De Doctor of Nurse Anesthesia Practice Program. We are truly delighted to welcome Congresswoman Lauren Underwood as we begin our celebration of National Nurses Week 2021. We are so grateful that given the Congresswoman's busy schedule, she has taken the time to participate in this conversation with us today. As many of you know, Congresswoman Underwood is a distinguished nurse leader who represents Illinois' 14th Congressional District, district in the United States House of Representatives. A fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, Congresswoman Underwood previously taught in our online graduate program in nursing here at Georgetown. She is the youngest African-American woman to serve in the House and the first woman and person of color to represent her community in Congress. Today's conversation will cover Congresswoman Underwood's leadership in maternal health, mental health, and veterans health, among other areas. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the Congresswoman for her continued engagement with our community here at Georgetown. She spoke on our campus in 2019, and we're very grateful for that time that she spent with us. And she has now taken the time during her busy, busy days to engage again with our students and our faculty. Welcome to this um, meeting, Congresswoman Underwood. To get us started, I will ask the first question, and this is the on Black maternal health. Um, Congresswoman Underwood, you have worked to address health disparities. This past year, we have seen yet again, and due to COVID-19, the significant health disparities that have been impacting communities of color. In the context of health dis inequities, we're hoping that you could give us an overview of your leadership with the Black Maternal Health Caucus and describe for us the Momnibus Act that you're engaged with. Well, Dr. Yearwood, thank you once again for having me. I'm so excited to be back with Georgetown University School of Nursing and Health Studies. I also want to just give a quick shout out to Dr. Mary Wakefield, who is not participating in today's event, but she remains a visiting distinguished scholar with the school and was such an incredible leader at HHS and, um, you know, incredible just pioneer and and person in nursing and um and so I want to give her a shout out but yes uh and all of the nurses happy national nurses week this is just uh such an important time for us to come together particularly after the year that we've all had um during this pandemic um I am a nurse I am so proud to be a nurse and my background does inform my work particularly in black maternal health um we are all I think familiar with the data that suggests that black birth people are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related complications than their white counterparts. This is a disparity that's been around my entire lifetime. I'm 34 years old. And, you know, we've not seen any national initiatives to really tackle this issue and save moms lives. For every death, we have 70 near misses. And so, you know, this issue around mortality and severe morbidity is one where, you know, with effort and intervention, particularly data-driven evidence-based interventions, we really can be successful in saving lives. And that's what the Mommy Bus is about. The Mommy Bus is a collection of 12 bills to comprehensively address every dimension of the Black maternal health crisis that we face in this country. So whether we're talking about social determinants of health, like nutrition and housing and transportation, or if we're talking about growing and diversifying the perinatal workforce, or perhaps even COVID-19 and the need to have birthing people, postpartum and lactating people included in these clinical trials for the treatments and for the vaccines so that we have recommendations for this very special vulnerable population, right? All of that is included in the mommy bus. And I'm really proud to report that we are now up to over 130 co-sponsors in the House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans. 
Um, we have a fabulous sponsor in the Senate, Senator Cory Booker, uh, who has stepped in to uh, our now vice president's shoes uh, since she's off at the White House and uh, not able to lead this initiative with us anymore. Um, and I'm just excited. You know, we have an opportunity to um, make such a big difference, not just for Black moms, but for all moms in this country, because we know that when we can improve the quality of care, we can improve outcomes for everyone. And so while we're centering the experiences, the voices of Black birthing people in this legislation, um, we know that we have a really robust multicultural coalition, API, Hispanic, Indigenous uh, folks who are benefiting literally from every single grant program and, and called out throughout the text, but then also all moms benefit um, from the impact that the mommy list will bring to our communities. Um, Congresswoman Underwood, I join Delma and Mary in welcoming you and thanking you. Uh, we're going to pivot just a little bit and talk specifically about health equity and nursing. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, next week, the National Academy of Medicine will release its report sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation yeah. uh, titled The Future of Nursing 2020 to 2030. Yes, charting, yes, charting yes. a path to achieve health equity. Yes. And as you know, and you've already mentioned, Dr. Mary Wakefield is actually a committee co-chair for this work. Um, so although we do not know yet what the report will say, we were wondering what your general thoughts are on how nurses can actually help lead in promoting health equity and addressing the determinants of health. Yeah. You know what? This is so important. Like, this is the key question. I don't think we have an option not to lead. We can't opt out. We can't look away. We can't unsee what we've seen, not only throughout our careers, but over the past year during the pandemic. And quite frankly, we are prepared. We have everything that we need in terms of tools, background, experiences, perspective, in order to be transformational leaders throughout our communities. And quite frankly, our patients are counting on us to do it. So often, um, you know, I really got this from uh, my experience teaching at Georgetown, where my students would say, you know, oh, why why do we have to engage in politics? You know, that's not, that's a little bit above my pay grade. You know, I'm just here to take care of my patients and leave that to somebody else. Like we cannot afford to have that kind of mindset on these larger systemic issues because they will never change if we do not step forward and do what we know to be right. And quite frankly, our communities are waiting for us to step in. They're waiting for our voices and, um, you know, it is our professional responsibility. It just is. And so, you know, nursing is a has a diverse workforce. We are literally in every single community. And can we be honest? We are we are perpetuating a healthcare system that allows certain people to die disproportionately of preventable causes. We are active participants in that. And so while we can sit back and say, oh no, it wasn't me. Oh, I didn't do that. Well, well, really, you know, over the past year, I think many of us, as we have, you know, embraced, you know, this concept of equity, we have wrestled with systemic racism throughout our society and throughout our healthcare system. You know, I hope that we have taken the opportunity to reflect on our role as individual clinicians, as individual providers in this larger system, if we haven't started to do that hard work, well, guess what? It's time. And then we have to have a commitment. We have to have the courage. We have to have the will and sheer determination to fight for change. And it starts with ourselves. It starts in our clinics. It starts in our units. It starts in our healthcare systems. It starts in our communities. But wherever we are physically located, we have the power to make transformational change. And I know that somebody's probably sitting here watching like, well, I didn't sign up to make transformational change. Well, guess what? Sorry, that's the job. I mean, that's what we're here to do. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a hardship. It probably won't even be a burden. It will probably be the most fulfilling professional experience you've ever had. Take it from me. I didn't necessarily think I was going to be a congresswoman. I just knew that we could not treat our health care as some kind of disposable thing where you know folks are treating it so cavalierly and I just could not stand for that, right? So I stepped up to run and here we are. Sometimes 
we just have to step into our power. We have to raise our voices and we have to lead change. And I can't wait to see this report um, because it is long overdue to have this conversation around equity, around justice and around nursing leadership. It will be fabulous. And I can't wait to see the impact that the Georgetown community has around our country. Thank you, Congresswoman Underwood. As a fellow Illinoisan, I'd personally like to welcome you to today's session. And I think what you just spoke about segues really nicely into the, the next question. And thank you for your service in teaching our graduate students, teaching them in the classroom as students to become engaged in the political arena, I think will certainly help that stepping stone. So again, thank you for joining us today. It's as many people know, you're a member of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. You've worked to promote veterans health through such initiatives as the Veterans Care Quality Transparency Act. And so can you tell us a little bit about your work with the veterans and some of the priorities in this area, such as in, health, in the mental health space to help veterans in crisis and to address the number of suicides we see each year? Thank you. So yes, you know, I love my work on Veterans Affairs. You know, there are two key healthcare issues that are overarching in my work. The first is dealing with and uh, addressing the gender specific care that we extend to our women veterans. Women veterans are the fastest growing segment of our veterans population. Um, and they're across the lifespan. So the VA is taking care of, you know, recently separated service members who might be in their early 20s to cadet nurse corps uh, members from world or to the other issue that I work on really aggressively is mental health and suicide prevention. And I think that we all know the statistics which say that we lose 20 veterans to suicide every day. Half of them are connected with the VA for care, but half of them aren't. A lot of my colleagues focus on those veterans that are disconnected, right? Because they're isolated, they're alone, they're suffering in our communities every day. Um, and we're trying to connect them with resources. I've been really focused on what we can do for those veterans who are getting care in the VA, right? Why is it that they come in for an appointment and then they leave and go and and die in the parking lot, right? They take their lives in the parking lot. There's something, we are failing. And there are, there's a rich evidence base to suggest some, you know, real clear intervention. So um, that's really the, the thought process behind the work that I do. So the Veterans Care Quality Transparency Act, which was signed into law last year by President Trump, um, we worked with his, his folks to get that done. It directs the general, the Government Accountability Office to assess the effectiveness of agreements that the VA has entered into with community providers for these mental health and suicide prevention services to make sure that they're providing high quality care, right? So that addresses the people in the community. We spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to try to reach those folks and bring them in. And oftentimes those clinical providers are not being held to the same high standards that folks within the VA are being held to, right? This is about oversight and accountability. So really proud of that. Then within the VA, um, we have a new bill, it's called the Lethal Means Safety Training Act, which um, I think is really important to, you know, do the education and training for all VA staff that might be interacting with that veteran, not just the psychiatrist, but everybody, the tech, the receptionist, right? Like anybody who might be engaging, if, because if that veteran's in crisis, you don't know who they're gonna share that with, and that person needs to be prepared. We also are not scared to address the issue of firearms, because firearms are the lethal means that these veterans are choosing to use. Right? Over 60% of veteran suicides involve firearms. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot be effective in um, really solving this problem if we are scared as policymakers to talk about firearms and to um, really engage in a way that helps keep this vulnerable population safe. That's really what I'm committed to. Now, we have some other work on appropriations related to veterans that I'm excited about. We're trying to get more funding for the VA's suicide prevention outreach programs, the Veterans Crisis Line. Obviously, within the Mommy Bus, we have a special 
special uh, bill just for uh, women veterans, the Protecting Moms Who Serve Act. And then, you know, we have some fun work around preventive services and access to contraception that I'm also working on on that committee. So we stay real busy on this veterans agenda, but I think it's good work that has a really meaningful impact. And uh, oftentimes we can do it in a bipartisan way. Thank you. Um, I, I know there were some technical issues and I want to make sure that that our audience hears everything that um, that you had said. So I know you had started over at, at some point. Um, I, it, but the, the first part of the question was the work that you're doing in, in the mental health space to help address veterans in crisis. But I, I think that segues into Dr. Yearwood's next question. So if if, if it got lost in translation, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Yearwood. Okay, thank you, Dr. Harris. Yeah, um, Congresswoman Underwood. So this is, mental health is, is a passion of mine. And um, I don't know if everyone's aware that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So what we would love to hear from you, um, if you could share, um, in addition to the amazing work that you're doing, specifically on um, veterans mental health and suicide rates we know are um, just out the roof with this population and we do need to spend a lot of time energy resources um, addressing the needs of this of this group of um, our, um, uh, our our um, consumers um, is are there other um, mental health initiatives that are underway that you're involved with, especially in the time of COVID? Are there other things that you're doing that we need to be um, supportive of and aware of? Thank you. So there's one bill I'm really excited about. Congresswoman Katie Porter is the lead sponsor and I've co-sponsored it. It's called the Stopping the Mental Health Pandemic Act which provides flexible federal funds for states and communities all across our country. Also so like the cities themselves, but also like the community health centers and other like local resources to address the mental and behavioral health challenges that have, this pandemic has caused. And we see it all around us, right? We've seen some communities reporting increased suicide rates, some communities reporting increased overdose rates. You know, people who um, have just been having a hard time with their families being alone and isolated over the last year. And we want to make sure that everybody has the resources that they need. When I was first running for Congress, I would tell my community, like, listen, I envision a, a mental health system that is as easily accessible around our community as we have massage envies. We have massage envies in every strip mall, <laughs> every strip mall in my community. And yet, People are searching for weeks and weeks and weeks trying to get in to see a mental health provider, right? There is an imbalance and there are many reasons for that, but we gotta take every opportunity to um, make a change and connect people to care. Now, there's other mental health related bills that I've sponsored um, that aren't necessarily COVID related, but it's all part of this problem. So the first I wanna share with you is the Primary and uh, Behavioral Healthcare Access Act which really makes sure that people who have private health care coverage can get three, three mental health care visits or substance use visits per year without any kind of co-payment, any, any co-insurance or any deductible related fee. That really came out of hearing about people who needed to, to get in to see a behavioral health care specialist, right? Um, they go see their primary care provider, have to pay a co-payment to get the referral. Then they go in to see this therapist and there's not a good connection. Here's another co-payment. And they're like constantly searching for somebody to, to develop a therapeutic relationship with at great expense and sacrifice. And we lose a lot of people to that process, right? Like that churn of trying to find that fit. That's what this bill is seeking to address. Really excited about it. The second one I want to tell you about is in the mommy bus. So again, I told you, well, I don't know if I told you. In my state of Illinois, um, the number one cause of maternal death is suicide and substance use disorders and mental health conditions. And so we wanted to address that head on. So we have a bill called the Moms Matter Act. It's uh, bipartisan and it provides a mental health 
maternal mental health equity grant program to fund community-based initiatives to support pregnant people and new moms with mental health conditions and substance use disorders. Um, and I think it will really save lives and we're so excited about it. And then the last one I wanna tell you about that we're introducing in just a couple weeks, it's called the Child Suicide Prevention and Lethal Means Safety Act which invests in youth suicide prevention and lethal means safety education and training for future healthcare providers. Here's the thing, in my community, since I've been in Congress, can't tell you the number of eight, nine, 10 year olds that we're hearing not just suicide ideation, but attempts and completion. And their schools are not prepared. Their parents are not prepared. Their healthcare providers do not have the resources. We don't have beds in our community. We don't have community level supports. And so these parents whose child might have just gotten out of intensive treatment is now facing the prospect of returning back to school. They're like, well, can I, can I safely send my kid to school and daycare, right? Without any kind of support, how do I help the people, the teachers, the social workers, the nurses, the daycare work, right? How do we help these people care for my child? during this time of crisis. We want to help. And so that's the kind of perspective that we're taking in the Congress. I'm really excited about it. Thank you for all your great work. And uh, this is a good segue into um, Nurses Week, which, uh, as you know, since our conversation today will, help, will actually help start a celebration of National Nurses Week. Uh, and uh, happy Nurses Week to you as well. We wanted to hear what you might like to say um, really, if you were speaking to the nursing workforce head on, especially given their incredible values based work during the pandemic, what would you like to say to the nurses? Well, I just like to say thank you. You know, I know that this is so difficult. The sacrifices that um, you've been making throughout your career have been enormous. And then this pandemic has just been on a whole nother level. I mean, I think about you know, the clinicians who would change their clothes in the garage before coming in, right? Not embrace their kids, perhaps sleep in separate rooms or a different wing in the house for fear of, in, of infecting their family members and the, just like the separation and the division that that caused, right? Um, the added stressors and burdens that have been uh, on your shoulders throughout the pandemic and the considerable grief and loss that we've all experienced collectively. Um, I know that that is, it's heavy and it is hard, um, but your work has made such an impact. And I am so pleased to have this opportunity to celebrate you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your commitment. Um, and thank you for the high degree of excellence that you continue to bring to work every day. You inspire your communities. Um, you literally help keep us all safe and healthy. And um, I hope that you are um, enjoying the possibilities that lie ahead as we begin to recover from this pandemic. I hope that um, you are continuing to take good care of yourselves because you have to. And I know that it's hard <laughs> to sometimes prioritize that and on top of everything else that's going on. But please be kind and gracious to yourself. And thanks for all you do. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'd like to circle back to something that you had mentioned earlier um, related to your journey to get to okay. this point. So a, a question that we had received from one of the participants was, how did you decide to make a professional journey from nursing to Congress? And what has that been like for you? So I spent my career working to expand healthcare coverage for communities across the country. I worked to implement the Affordable Care Act at the federal level. I was in the Obama administration working on public health emergencies and disasters. And uh, just before I ran, I was working for a Medicaid managed care plan in Chicago. I happened to go to my then congressman's one and only town hall in 2017. And it was during the time of Obamacare repeal. And he said that he was only going to support a version of repeal that let people with pre-existing conditions keep their health care coverage. And so I'm a nurse, I worked on the ACA and I have a pre-existing condition. So when he made that promise, I believed him because it was personal, deeply personal to me. And then a couple of weeks later, he voted for the American Health Care Act, which is a version of repeal that did the opposite. It made it cost prohibitive for people like me to get affordable coverage. And I got really upset and said, you know what, it's on, I'm running and launched the campaign. That's exactly what happened. I got mad and I couldn't let it go. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so, you know, like sometimes those things happen and you might not set out for that to be the case. Um, but, you know, you have to have the courage to, to lead and, you know, here we are. So Congresswoman Underwood, we are very grateful for your energy, your passion. Um, you have started us out this week, National Nurses Week, in, a, in an amazing and memorable way. Um, you know, I think we were all sort of sliding down because of COVID and all the Zoom meetings and everything. And you have just brought us a refreshing perspective. We applaud your energy, your work, your um, amazing advocacy for all people in the many, many um, endeavors that you're engaged with and in. And um, we as nurses are grateful that you are a nurse and we applaud that um, and for your, your strong voice for nursing. And um, we are behind you, 100, we've got your back. We're 100% behind you. Um, and just let us know what we can do to continue to help you uh, and move some of these initiatives forward. Georgetown is very, very, very lucky to have you start us off this week as our speaker. Um, and just an aside, one of the things I forgot to mention earlier, we have been spending quite a lot of energy and time here on campus also looking at the mental health of our students. So we have an initiative that's going on, encouraging our students to reach out and encouraging our community to be um, uh, strong allies when they see someone who's struggling. So we do want to say that we are trying to think outside the box and be creative in this really, really huge space that needs a lot of work. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you. We are indebted to you. Uh, if you need nurses, just call on us. We're here, okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I so appreciate the time uh, and the opportunity to speak with everyone today. And I hope you have a fantastic week of celebration. Thank you.